welcome here to a very special edition of Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora here for you inside of such an amazing opportunity that we have here. I've spoken with Anson Mount off the air a few times here over these last few months, and now we get to do something on the air and make it special. He is wearing the wrong attire. I'm wearing the correct attire. So I actually have a shirt that says, Are You Human?, which I wear for many purposeful reasons, is a deeper message in today's world. But if you look close here, it says, are you inhuman? And when you turn it off, the light's off, it's supposed to glow. But I'm going to show this to Anson since he's wearing a Tennessee Titans thing. This is what we do in this studio, and this is how we live here. So I'll put that up for you. (laughs) (laughs) How are you, sir? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing well. So Anson Mount, obviously, here with us on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora, a well-known actor in so many different places in this uh, awesome world that we live in when it comes to the cinema as well as you know on your screen when you're sitting at home and watching the show you've gotten to do so many different things Anson and we're going to link it back to sports as well but do you have a favorite that you've done in your career up to this point uh a a favorite a favorite gig favorite gig that you've done yeah um it's hard to say uh there's so many that are close to my heart because you know there there uh, there's so many memories tied up into into each. In terms of, I guess the things that I'm the most proud of, uh, I think in film it would either be my first film Tully, uh, or the first film that I produced Cook County, uh, and in TV I, I just I, I was with Helen Wheels for so long and such a big part of my life and I, I met my wife while I was doing it and uh, yeah that that shows very close to my my heart so you mentioned Helen Wheels and I have family members that are so drawn to that show you said that that was special for you and obviously where you met your wife bring me into why that character and that world that you got to live in has left such a lasting impression on you outside of the fact that, I mean, obviously we could dive into the fact that when you meet your wife on set of something, I would say it's pretty compelling. Um, Part of it is just having lived in that character's boots for so long. Yeah. Um, That there, 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 there does come a point when you're doing long running television that you kind of take ownership of the character and the dialogue between you and the, and the writers, particularly your showrunner becomes extremely important, important because they're taking cues from you as well, just in conversation, just if the relationship is good, you know? Yeah. Uh, And, and the, the smart writers are the ones who, who listen to, to, the instincts, not the wild hair up the ass ideas that some that actors have, and I have them too, but really just sort of the instinctual sensibilities of where the character may or may not want to go. Um, and with Cullen, you know, I, I started, I start every character, especially in television, where you have to be very careful with the footprints that you put down because you're going to be walking those shoes for a long time and you want to make sure that they fit. Yeah. With every character I play, there's very few things that I know. And my one of my hooks into, into Cullen was having grown up in rural Tennessee, where in my generation, all my friends' fathers, you know, my father was older, so he was a World War II vet, but all my friends' fathers were Vietnam vets. And I grew up just thinking that 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 men of that age were, were um, emotionally turned off and uh, not that, not that open, hard to get to know sullen. Um, And later on, when I was able to put things into context, I realized that there was a lot of PTSD going on. And so that was, that was one of my ends as having grown up in the South. And that's why I think I also felt in the, thank God the the creators felt the same way, that it was very important to have an actual Southern American play the role. Yeah, you know, and, and when you talk about learning of these characters, trying to get to know the character, bring that character to life, 
what is your method of going about that? Because like you said, with this t- with this story that you got to play in Hell on Wheels, you had a connection to that and you had a bridge that you could already walk across. But if you're playing a role of somebody that's totally outside of the stratosphere you're used to, how do you create who that character is? What type of method or kind of check and balance do you go through with yourself to become that character anybody who tells you that they have a tried and true method to acting uh is a snake oil salesman uh it's not it's not true there are multiple methods uh you learn through experience the the ways of working that benefit you and benefit the role and those which don't. Um, I feel like I have to almost reinvent what I do with every role. Yeah. Um, And each role has very different um, hurdles to overcome. And for, for Colin, I mean, it was, like we, like I said, getting in, into that PTSD mindset, which I've never been to war, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I've never been to war. So I kind of, I kind of had a, a I, for whatever reason, I also tend to be, a, a, I work well working outside to in. Like if I can find the physicality of a character, I can kind of find the imaginative life. Um, so just starting with that, that those visuals and those experiences that I had with, with men of a certain age having PTSD, um, getting into it in, in that way. And just the way of talking and the, and actually the, the, you know, the, the, the creators were Southern as well. And that there's a very particular type of Southern humor uh, that doesn't exist anywhere <laughs> else. Uh, a very pat kind of sardonic kind of, of in, in necessarily self-deprecating humor that, um, that just is a way in as, as, as much as when I read the books, uh, when I read William Gay or I read Corm- Cormac McCarthy, there are turns of phrase in those books that I can just hear. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, it's just, and they, they take me back. Like I can smell the fall leaves in my backyard in white bluff, Tennessee, when I read these words, um, So, yeah, a lot of that was experiential and finding a way to bring that into the work when I haven't lived in that community in a a very long time was something like Star Trek. I mean, it it was is as much about getting out of the way of of Pike and and recognizing the parts of me that are that are very close to him because for whatever reason, I'm I'm as a character, uh, as a person, I'm closer to Pike than most any other role that I've, that I've played. I don't know why that is. I just recognize it. And I know that part of the process was learning how to get out of the way. And, and then there, you learn tricks of the trade, right? Like you, when you're doing action, both of those shows are action and you, you learn um, <laughs> the, one of the trap doors of doing action adventure is it can become, it can become very overtly deliberate and and through that it can it can tend to be one note or it can tend to be monotonous in its in its deliberateness and you you have to learn when you you look for opportunities to play the back foot and on star trek we've gone <laughs> a lot farther uh and even I don't think it was anybody's intention to set out to make comedy when we started doing <laughs> strange new worlds, but we have, we have found that everybody really likes doing it. And so we've, you know, with the leadership of, of Akiva and Henry, we've really decided, okay, let's keep going now. Here with Anson Mount here on wake of call with Dan Tortora today. And we're, you know, obviously with, with what I do at Dan Tortora broadcast media, wake up call, our sports show, superpowered pop, our entertainment show. There's a lot of different things that we do here. We're kind of, interwoven with them in a lot of ways and many times especially with speaking with Anson you brought up your father and he has a very special connection that will live on forever and and obviously uh, he had passed a while back but 
with his football forecasts and what he did for over three decades with Playboy magazine and not only giving us sports through Playboy magazine, but his accuracy and his ability to kind of see things down the line. You talked to me about that when the second time that we spoke, you and I were discussing this off the air and I'd love for you to dive into that and how your father was such a deep, deeply into the sports world and found success in prognostication. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't even know where to begin. Uh, my, my father, you know, he grew up with, with no shoes and two sets of overalls and, and white bluff Tennessee in the, during the depression. And, um, his father had died of tuberculosis when he was an infant and, um, his mother ran a boarding house, uh, and they raised geese. So his nickname was goose. And, um, they, um, yeah, they were just fist to mouth. And then, uh, my, so he had an uncle who apparently ran a den of iniquity in, in Nashville and had bought them a, a radio as a gift. And he turned it on one evening when he was 11 or 12 and um, heard the sound that he fell in love with. And the sound was classical music. And when he was 13, he found out that the, the premier orchestra at the time was the Minneapolis Philharmonic. And they were going to be coming through Nashville. And my, so my father hitchhiked one day to Nashville and uh, didn't have any money for a ticket and was there early and, and, and uh, found the, uh, the, the stage manager was half lit and convinced, convinced them to let him help load instruments onto the stage. And the guy let him, let him backstage for the show. And Dimitri Metropolis, who is to this day, if you say the name Dimitri Metropolis to any classical music buff, they i was just with Clis christopher lloyd uh who is who is a big classical music buff has been his entire life and he he just about died when i brought up dimitri yeah. so dimitri metropolis the conductor comes out and is getting ready to make his entrance and he sees my father this kid in overall standing backstage <laughs> and he says you what are you doing here and my father is is he tries to explain and he's nervous and Dimitri takes him and he sits him in the front row and he says, you sit here. He goes and he conducts the entire symphony. And then uh, afterwards he takes my father to dinner with the first violinist and gets his whole story and then has his car take him home. And the next day, Dimitri goes to White Bluff, Tennessee and meets my grandmother and all my dad's friends and his boy scout troop. And then he um, he begins to fly my father to New York in the summers to have him educated and uh, given classes in elocution and manners and taken to the museums. Well, of course, he barely saw him at Dimitri because Dimitri was so busy. But um, later on, my father, um, he, he, he signed up to go fight Hitler. And he worked on an aircraft carrier, um, which he hated, and but ended up between World War II and Korea, ended up in a VA hospital in Florida with tuberculosis. And um, while he was in the hospital, he had uh, nothing really to do. Um, oh, sorry, I'm leaving out a very important point. Before, before that, he'd gone to Swanee on the GI Bill, and Dimitri had helped to pay for his education as well while he was there. And then um, when he was in the hospital, he, he had very little to do. So all he had to do was, was paint, play the banjo and, and write. And he saw advertisement for a short story contest. And the winner would be published in this brand new magazine called Playboy. And so he entered and he won first place and he got published. And they called him and said, well, if you like a job when you get out of the hospital, there's one waiting for you in Chicago. So on a total arc, my father moved to Chicago and Playboy at the time was a half a floor of office cubicles in, in downtown Chicago. And uh, he had to drive a cab to supplement his income because they weren't making any money. Yeah. 
and Hef made my father the religion editor because he had gone to an Episcopal school. And, and a lot of people forget that there was a religion column in Playboy because Hef was very smart. He's, he saw that there was either, he was either going to invite a, a boycott or a conversation. And my father's job was, in, was being in charge of, of curating that conversation and reaching out to members of the clergy, inviting them to write whether they disagreed or agreed with the new ethics, according to Playboy. And then uh, he began traveling to colleges and universities, uh, participating in debates. And uh, a very famous one, actually, it's, it's considered the last time the entire student body and faculty at Sewanee was gathered together in one place at one time was when he was invited uh, back to, to debate his college roommate, uh, Father Bill Ralston, who had become an Episcopal priest. And uh, apparently, Father Ralston just absolutely drug him up and down the stage. <laughs> <laughs> my father brought a playboy bunny as a date thinking that he was gonna he was gonna charm his way through it and that didn't work um so this this goes on for 10 or so years until the sexual evolution starts to happen and and then uh uh hef calls a meeting and says somebody brought up a very good point we're a men's magazine we don't have a sports column <laughs> who knows anything about <laughs> about football and nobody raised their hand except for my dad. And he said, yeah, I watch the games on Saturdays sometimes. He was a big college fan. And, uh, and have said, okay, that's it. We're killing religion. You're taking sports go. And my father flipped out. He was a biology major. He didn't know anything about sports writing. So he, uh, he contacted every sports athletic director in the country. And he said, I'm going to send you a questionnaire. And if you fill it out, I'll get you a subscription. So my father ended up calling together all of this information that included, he knew who was making grades, who was a discipline problem, uh, who had good leadership, um, you know, who, so see, he, he really used all of this information in order to become the best sports prognosticator that there was. And he never bet again, never bet a nickel on a game and was, fiercely uh, opinionated about that fact that he felt that gambling was taking the fun out of sports. Yeah. And, uh, and he maintained that he would rather go and, and uh, to Suwannee and root for the purple and the gold any, any Saturday than he would to place a bet in Vegas. Well, I have something in common with your father then, because as I head toward 20 years in broadcasting, we don't have to do this. And I work for myself, but the day I stepped in as a broadcaster back in 2003, I said, I won't put money on anything because I feel like knowing the coaches and the players, and I think it's an unfair advantage. I, I don't, I don't think it's the right thing to do. So anytime anybody asks me to do anything for money, I always say to them politely, no, I'm not going to be in that league. And they would say, well, what if you won something? I said, to donate it to charity. I, I don't. I don't want money from it. So I think that's a great thing that your father did. And I think that it's, it's beautiful because I understand that world and it keeps it somewhat pure where you can watch the games in a different manner. So I commend him for that because that, that means a lot to me too. That's great. Yeah. I, well, you're, I mean, you're putting your reputation on the line. Jimmy, the Greek actually called my father an idiot one time because he wouldn't bet. And he probably could have made a lot of, actually, yeah, he would have made a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There were, there were, I think there were at least two uh, beat ants and mount contests in Playboy. That if you could pick the season better, is, if you could pick the pro season, the NFL season better than my father, then you would get an all expense paid trip to the Super Bowl. And they, it ended up going to my father because nobody could outpick him. Yeah. Well, you know, and that's, the thing is, is, is he, he had a different angle on it. He, he knew what was going on. He knew the inner workings of it. The story you just told about your father, so vast, and you brought us through decades of time. Did this come from just learning from him and, and, and having the conversation, multiple conversations? Did you just have a desire to know, did this come from things that you found in the house? I mean, how, how did you learn about the road that your father took? Because, and I ask this because when you talk about World War II, especially 
my grandfathers, my grandmothers, both both sides involved in some way. And so I learned from sitting at the table and recording and just wanting to hear and retain the information. But my great uncle Pat, he had binders of different things that went on. And I sat with him for over two hours one day at his kitchen table to discuss it with him. So how did you learn about this trail that your father took throughout his life? Was it just conversations between father and son or did it go beyond that into things maybe you found after he passed or, or go a little bit deeper into that? Partly, partly from that, partly from my father, that he passed when I was 13. Yeah. Uh, my mother has filled in a lot of that for me, as did Father Ralston, who who became a good friend of mine later on when I was at Sewanee. Um, and uh, I have older siblings. Yeah. So I've just sort of like been able to piece it together here and there. Uh, he's he's got a a lot. Uh, he was he was he was writing a lot about his life towards the end and. I think that all of those are not all of those notes are in the archives at Sewanee. Um, uh, and I've got a lot of recordings of his. I haven't been able to bring myself to listen to because it's just been so long. Well, and that that's the other side of it, too, is is when you're playing these characters and playing these roles, you're you're taking up and and building out of nothing in a lot of ways. Someone that people fall in love with or they hate. They have a lot of emotions with. So when you step away in your Anson, because everybody knows you're this character or that character, when you get to be you and you get to sit with that, how do you kind of navigate through detaching yourself from who people know you to be and who you truly are and the emotions that go into that? I don't really think about it, honestly. Uh, if they're caught up in that, that's their that's their issue. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's 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 a particularly American thing for us to um, it, think of our actors as these sort of like shaman who ch channel spirits or get lost in the role, right? Yeah. yeah, I get asked this question all the time. Do you ever get lost in your role? Like, you know, do you get lost in your dentistry or your <laughs> or whatever you do? Like, I don't I don't understand the question. It's a craft, right? Yeah, I do pottery too. I didn't get lost in my pots, um, but we have this thing where we want our actors to be these kinds of, I don't, channels, you know. And we, you, you go to you go to the theater in England, and you you, you know you go to the bar afterwards, and you see the guy that was playing Hamlet at the bar. You don't ask him if he's still Hamlet, <laughs> right? Yeah. But for some reason, we we want our actors to to, I don't know, we we. Our, our 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 need to have a royalty uh in this country where we you know we've always put our our movie stars particularly and our rock stars on pedestals that has that has sort of started to take on kind of a metaphysical quality which i think is strange yeah. uh, i i i think that we should treat acting and actors in a much more practical way and I find that very interesting because I know so many people, they get so wrapped up into the roles of, of actors and actresses that they feel that you are that person all the time and that you can't. And I find it interesting because if you were Black Bolt all the time, then uh, you wouldn't be saying much of anything. So I do want to jump to that for a second because I know that that's a role that was played by you a couple of times, once on television and then once in at Dr. Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. And we'll go into this more when we have you join us on Superpowered Pop. But I am wearing my Inhuman shirt today, so I do have to pose this. When you and I met, I had said to you the first time that I had ever met you, and I said, this he's either going to laugh at it or he's just going to think I'm nuts, is I said that uh, my ex-girlfriend, who I was supposed to go to that convention with, we had broken up, and there was a lot of things that kind of went on in that relationship that were not healthy and uh, got out of it for the right reasons. And I had said to you, I wish I brought her today because with you being black I said, I wish I brought her so you could say hi. And, <laughs> and, and I remember you had, you actually had a mask on and you laughed when, uh, when we had that exchange, but playing a role of that type is so unique because you can't say anything. 
And I want to ask you this because I don't want to believe it's true. And I know we've talked about this off the air, but Black Ball can't be that stupid, right? He to to know that when his mouth was gone to freak out and start to start to murmur something in that moment. Can you bring me into Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness? Because you broke my heart off the air. We'll talk about that on Super Powered Pop. I don't want to talk about it here today, but I do want to get a little bit more into that role. And shouldn't he have known better? <laughs> well, that wasn't our universe's black ball, right? True. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. Anything is possible in the what is it? What was that movie? Anything is possible. Oh no, it was Doug Henning. Doug Henning. Remember Doug Henning? I'm the, trying. The illusionist. Okay. Okay. All that right. is his um his gorgeous assistant, Kathy. Um, and he, his catchphrase was anything is possible with the world in the world of illusion. Yeah. Uh yeah, anything's possible in the multiverse. So yeah. I just I think it's an incredibly freeing idea to to say okay this is just this is in the universe where that happens <laughs> you know yeah <laughs> instead of having to have these long drawn out conversations about my character character wouldn't do that uh yeah. and i i love to have those shackles taken away so could we could we see you again i mean anybody's guess man i i could it, even if i was um you know if i was contractually bound not to say anything i wouldn't say anything but i'm not contractually bound <laughs> that, that i can tell you so not con contractually bound by disney and marvel so if you can speak freely about black bolts because it's a character that means so much to me as the leader of the inhumans what would you like what are your thoughts because the shackles have been taken off what what would you like to say oh uh, Man, I, you know, I, I handed up a, a property, an existing property to, to um, a couple of people at Marvel, including Kevin, to look at and consider, because if you're ever going to, if you're ever going to do it, it would be a great way to do it. I don't want to, I don't want to say which one, um, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's hard to do Black Bolt without doing the Inhumans. Mm -hmm. It's kind of possible. Yeah. And um they it's it's pretty clear that they don't want to revisit that. <laughs> uh so I don't know. We'll can, I can I throw at you? And this is simply from talking to you a, a bunch on, you know, well, the first time on the air, but off the air as well. And also your look and kind of your demeanor with certain things. I can see I could see a Reed Richards in you. I could see him, Mister Fantastic. I could. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, you know, it's that's that's at a, that's that's dancing at a level that I'm not. You know, I'm 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 not in that uh, party. Uh, and I I heard that they made a choice with Reed Richards. I don't know if it's true or not. Yeah, but, there's, there's been a lot of thoughts in this multiverse of who is and who's not. Right. So, yeah, I've, I've, heard, I've heard that before and I, I could be so lucky, but I think that I'm kind of established as, as uh black bolt at this point. But that property, like you said, that you're, that you're not kind of divulging, which I totally understand. There are so many places that you can go. Do you like living in the Marvel universe? Because you. Yeah, you absolutely. I, I, I had a tremendously good time doing both the show and doing Dr. Strange. It, it, Working with Sam Raimi was a bucket list item. Um, uh, getting to to collaborate and play out this crazy idea that 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 Kevin Feige had had um, was an enormous amount of fun. And um, yeah, it's just it's every modern actor's dream come true is to is to be a, one of the great Marvel characters. And I I got one of the best ones. I mean. Black Bolt is up there and he's numbered like in the top three uh, characters that I would have picked to play. Who are the other ones if you had to pick? Well, I mean, I've, I've discussed this before, so it's, I don't think it's any secret. I I, I love Gambit. Um, he's the Southern superhero. 
so obviously he's a little he's somewhat close to my heart um yeah uh that i i, I don't <laughs> i don't know what happened to that um, <laughs> that's uh there's a there's a there's a there's a story there somewhere in that development process uh that uh i don't have really any access to i've just heard rumors about but um at some point they need to make that yeah so you said that was one of them was there another one besides gambit and black bolt oh gosh i mean those are the those are the big two um I don't know. I'd have to think, you know, the, the other one, the other one that comes to mind is a different, is a different uh, comic book company. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Cause I could also see you as Batman. That's just my, I could see I, that. I've heard that. Yeah. I, I can see that. But in this world that we live in, where there are so many different, you know, avenues that you can take, you chose the Avenue of the Tennessee Titans. I understand it because of the connection to your family and all. But here's my question for you that I find to be very important and the world should know. Is there a better chance we see the full extent of Black Bolt's power or a better chance that we see Tennessee win a Super Bowl in the next 10 years? <laughs> <laughs> I think we got a good shot at winning a Super Bowl in the next 10 years. I honestly do. Um, I, you know, I, I think, I think Vrabel's done an amazing job and, and the franchise is clear, clearly behind him. Yeah, that's very true. So the Tennessee Titans here, formerly the Houston Oilers, and now the Texans, obviously, since 2002, have been able to take that city and try and do something with it. Anson Mount, who you've known for many different roles around this beautiful world of cinema on the small screen and the big screen. We have more work on Super Powered Pop, but you've gotten to spend some time here on Wake Up Call. We do something called Rapid Fire, Anson. So you've been gracious in answering my questions. I'm going to let you ask the questions. You get three. You can ask me anything you want. You get to host for the next three questions. And I don't know if actors ever get to ask questions. So now you do. Oh, my goodness. Um, Man, I wish you you told me this prior. I would have come prepared. It's got to be on the fly. That's why I do it like this. Um, So, okay. So, wait. So, you're you're a Carolina fan. No. Jackson. There you go. That's it. The colors screw me up, man. So Jacksonville fan. All right. Yes, sir. First of all, you do you guys get the top pick this year? No, that was two years in a row. Not anymore. Okay. All right. Okay. Carolina has the top pick. All right. And see, there I go again. There you go. How did you end up in Syracuse? Or are you from Syracuse? How did you end up a Jacksonville fan? So born and raised in Syracuse and spent all spent time in Pennsylvania, came back here, went down to Florida. And when I was down in Florida working at an ESPN affiliate and Disney at the time, I started a to build a relationship with the Jacksonville Jaguars. That relationship is now 12, if not 13 years old. They were my favorite team when they came out in 1995. First game I ever got to go to. And I just, I built a relationship with them professionally in back in 2010. And so I cover their game, cover their home games, do their playoff games. So I'm back and forth to Florida all the time covering my favorite team. And I kind of have a unique story for the NFL because my first NFL game ever in my life that I went to, I was sitting in the press box, free food, free parking, and then got to go downstairs and interview the players whose cards I collect. That was my first experience of the NFL, which was pretty cool. Okay. Last question. What is the best one season turnaround in college football history? Uh, The best one season turnaround in college football history. I mean, it's up for opinion, but there is only one answer. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so i would say coming from my hometown we've done some incredible things so i would probably tell a few of those stories of how this syracuse team spun it around and how back in 1959 they went undefeated and won a national championship when there was a lot of lot of hate and uh and racism toward just having teams that were that had african americans on the team and what ernie davis did and all that so 
I want to hear your answer now because I know that now I'm thinking about Syracuse's moments in their history. It's been a long time since they've had a turnaround, but they did go from four and eight to ten and three recently within the last decade. But I want to hear yours. Well, it's a kind of a pointed question because I wanted to talk about my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and we did an episode about it. Yeah, go ahead. Um the 1999 Hawaii Warriors. Yeah. From in 98, they were ranked. I want to say it was, they were ranked 112th out of 112 teams in the NCAA. <laughs> at the time. Yeah. And then in 99, they won, uh, they took a three-way, uh, they, they won a share. They won a three-way share in the uh, Western Conference. They beat Alabama. See, I would come at you with the UAB Blazers in 2017 when they canceled their football program, didn't play in 15 or 16, and then came back in 2017, had a winning record after they gave themselves their own death penalty and have made it to a bowl game in every single season since then and and would have made it in 2020 if they chose to go. They were 6-3. and So they've had winning records since they killed their own football program and brought it back. Wow. I would say that. Well, if you want to hear about mine, <laughs> plug, plug. Yeah. Uh, we have my, my podcast is called The Well, which is it's about creativity. And and this episode with Coach June Jones was about how he came in to not just change the team, but to change a culture of losing to a culture of winning and how that actually had as much to do with educating the community and involving the community as it did anything else. And, uh, and it's, it was a, is a fascinating interview. Uh, it's one of my favorite, the, the favorites that we've done. And kind of connecting it all back. June Jones also coached before he went to Hawaii. He coached at actually after he coached at Hawaii, he came over to SMU and yeah. I got to cover him at SMU. Oh, really? In that small world. So yeah, I actually got to, be around him when the American Athletic Conference started. So he is, I have been told by by members of the press that he is the best coach at press outreach that they've ever come across. Yeah, there's I mean, listen, there's some good ones. And and I was talking about this before too. And it works with anything, coaching, you know, acting, whatever it may be, that I actually said it on the show earlier on, is that I only want to talk to the people that win in a humble manner and lose with grace and anything beyond that. I don't want to talk to because I don't like the egos and I don't like the people that refuse interviews when they're going through adversity. So I would say that there's, there's a great list of coaches and June helped to lead in to the American teams like SMU and being, I still remember being in the room and kind of standing off to the side and, and seeing him there and just people talking about it going, Hey, that's, that's, that's June Jones. Like that's somebody you need to talk to. I mean, there's certain people that have built a history, Willie Fritz down in Tulane where I was, I'll never forget being told that coach right there is going to win in Tulane. And I looked at him and I said, why? And he said, because he wins everywhere he goes. And sure enough, he has. So there's a lot of great connections that you can make in the community of sports and entertainment. I got to make one by simply going to, a convention with Anson Mount. I can't thank you enough. And I, I look forward to having you back on soon as well as on Superpowered Pop. We've kind of mixed sports and entertainment today as we typically do here where sports meets life. But I met you at a convention. I talked to you for two or three minutes. You spoke to me about the well, your podcast. And from there, you know, I feel like we've gotten to build a connection here where you've been extremely kind and giving of your time. And I can't thank you enough for that because I didn't anticipate that from every actor, but I've gotten it from you. So I do appreciate that. Yeah, man. It was a pleasure. Would love to do this again.